landscape studies, in France in particular. Uh, Michel himself undertook his own studies at the École Nationale Supérieure du Paysage at Versailles, uh, where he worked in the studios with um, Michel Corrigeau and uh, Alexandre Shemetov. There he and Christine Danocchi also set up their own studio. The Versailles School has been very much uh, responsible for a new approach to landscape design um, inspired by phenomenology. Uh, since then, uh, Michel has worked closely with many international architects, particularly Renzo Piano, um, with whom he worked on a project that many of you have seen at the Rue de Meaux in Paris. Um, in the early 90s, he was asked to participate in the strategy for the regeneration of public space in Lyon, uh, where he's created two public squares in different parts of the city. One of them right in the center, at the, adjacent to the Théâtre des Célestins, and the other in a completely different part of the city, near the social housing of Tony Garnier. His most recent project has been working on the landscape for the Millennium Dome. All Michel's projects take the site as the starting point for the project. Observing the given landscape and knowing how to discern the reasons behind its particular formation provide the elements that determine his design. Devine works with the natural elements seeking always to guarantee the authenticity of the landscape, although at the same time making a clear aesthetic statement of his own. When he first lectured at the A, which I think was about six years ago, um, Michel didn't speak any English and I had the privilege of trying to translate his lecture. Since then and after a year teaching at Harvard, he's completely fluent in the language. <laughs> I would just like to mention that in addition to tonight's lecture, he will be working with the Landscape Urbanism course, and there will be tomorrow um, a seminar uh, together with a presentation, and it, other students other than those on the Landscape Urbanism are very, very welcome to attend. So in the morning, I will put up a notice to say where that will be taking place. Let me welcome Michel Devine. So, sorry, my English is not very good, <laughs> even after one year at Harvard. So, first slide, please. So, um, it, it's a lecture about some processes. And this first drawing I show have been done more than 10 years ago, <coughs> sorry, in Roma, in Villa Medici. And with Christian Dalnocki, we studied um, this kind of natural shapes. These shapes are erosion, they are deltas or littorals, and we were interested in the relationship which exists between shapes and mechanism. So all these shapes can be understood just because we understand the phenomenon, like erosion. So on this picture, we so it's, it's from an aerial picture, and sorry, does it work? So this is a river, and this is a city, and we were interested in the superimposition which <laughs> exists between the river and some kind of wharf, which have been constructed along the river. And we did sort of projects in Torrent. So this is an axonometric showing a valley. And in this Torrent, we built some pieces dealing with the alluvion carried by the Torrent. <coughs> These are very small models in concrete we did. The principle was just to build elementary sh shapes or buildings, and w we played with uh, uh, gravels and a stream of water, and trying to, I don't know how to say that, but 
to make the nature to make drones the nature so that means we we wanted this uh, small built pieces to have interference with natural mechanism like erosion of deposit the fact the deposition this word is not english probably so we did all this work because we I think it's still, a, it's still a, an issue about nature. And we wanted first to individuate was what, wh what was nature, what was built. And it's not always easy. And we were, we thought that there is a, ve a kind of facility, and everybody is land in la landscape architecture, <coughs> is just working with nature without a real consciousness and we wanted to really understood this mechanism i'm sorry we'll see with that with other uh, projects it's not easy to speak now about this project but what is very important is this consciousness of the shapes are really in relationship with mechanism if we isolate a shape it's dead. This shape has no sense without the knowledge and the consciousness of the mechanism. So just after this work, we were working with Renzo, Renzo Piano in uh, very close to Trieste, which is uh, an Italian city close to the Yugoslavian border. And Renzo Piano was supposed to build an hotel in this abandoned quarry. And we were supposed to do a kind of garden in this abandoned plateau. This plateau is 10 meters above the level of the sea. What we proposed is to deal with the tide, because in this place of the Mediterranean, there is two meters of tide. Uh, the Adriatic is a place where the tide is uh, emphasis because of the shape of this sea. And what we propose is to dig this plateau, building a succession of ponds, just keeping this kind of um, dam and dealing with the tide. So during the day, it's a succession of stages the first drawing show the low tide when the sea is uh, low these two ponds are filled um, when the tide is low is high sorry this pond were supposed to be um, with fresh water because there was a sergeant in the place and this is a drawing showing the situation when all the pond uh, are full of water. The reference of that was were salt marsh. And this was a kind of result of this project. So it was all a kind of grading project dealing with um, the knowledge we had of the rock. We, we did this work with uh, Italian University with a very precise knowledge of the quality of the rock and of the movement of the water in this different pond. And what we wanted to do is a very explicit building. So all these dams are very bi are built. And the natural shape you can see are in relationship with um, the geology and with the uh, hydrology of these ponds. <laughs> and one more time, we wanted to be very clear about what is built, was what is not built. In the same time, we did a kind of very small prototype. It was still with Renzo Piano. It was in Naples. And we were supposed to do two small patio and we did exactly what uh, are doing all the forest men. So it's a kind of re 
reproduction of a natural landscape, uh, Maquis Mediterranean. And we planted it. This is just when we planted, not the trees, but uh, shrubs. Everything is done according to uh, geometrical grid, but the species are different according to this grid. And very quickly, because of the competition, uh, some shapes appear. And we didn't really draw these shapes. It's like in forest, competition between species uh, which draw. So this alley is um, one meter. More recently, we did the same kind of project uh, with Jean Nouvel for a competition in Berlin. We, we lost it. And so these shapes are supposed to be this kind of competition phenomenon I show you. But we did that in a strange project. You must consider it like, uh, I need some help, Chateau de Cartes. Castle cart. So <laughs> these plants are horizontal and these plants are vertical. And all the building of Jean Nouvel was glass, a glass building. And the landscape was done only with kind of layer, vertical and horizontal. And every layer was living as this Naples prototype <coughs> shown. So this is another project with, we did with Renzo Piano in Paris. Uh, you probably have seen it, Sandra told me. So it's a housing project. And this is a courtyard, 60 meters by 24. And we just planted, um, I don't remember the number, but something like 120 birches. And the drawing at the ground level is done like the fifth facade, we said it's a kind of facade on the floor, on the ground. <laughs> so this is night. This is during um, summer, winter. It's very easy. So when we did that first, a series of projects um, were existing. Uh, more composed, probably overdrawn, I guess. And we did that just saying it's a kind of milieu, ecological milieu. Of course, it's not ecological at all. It's, everything is artificial. It's a kind of <coughs> transposition from an ecological um, reference. For example, the, the ground cover is a very vulgar and artificial kind of shrub. And we used it because it was not expensive and easy to be maintained. So it looks like a piece of forest. And to convince the client, we went in a forest, quite similar dimension. But in reality, everything is fake. And it's a transposition of an ecological uh, reference. But I think it was the first time in France that we used this kind of attitude. Nothing is grown. It's just a kind of material we uh, used in this courtyard. After what I think things have been moved, it was l'air du temps. I don't know the translation of that. Uh, for example, Dominique Perrault did the same kind of project in La Grande Bibliothèque. But, so it was not grown because I think this is a kind of default we have in landscape architecture, mostly in France, is to overdraw, to compose space. And this is just dealing with um, medium. So this is a, a very ugly plan, I must say. This is what was public. It was a public territory on the east part of Montpellier. This plan has been drawn probably uh, nine years ago. And it was a kind of strategy. So how to plant 1,500 hectares of development of the city. And this document has been incorporated in uh, um, 
legal uh, document for the city, for the development of the city. The strategy was very simple. Um, in that direction, there were kind of s sort of small rivers, and there is a special, a specific palette for this plantation. In this other direction, it is uh, built because historically these were uh, edges protecting from wind. And from an existing language, we tried to purpose this strategy using the same language very rigorously and applying it on construction on public space and prescription on private spaces. So this plan is not a nice plan, but what we have done during now 10 years is to apply it at every scale. So that means for new quarter, new housing, for new commission, everything is controlled with very rigorous application of this plan. And it starts to be something interesting. So unfortunately, I have just two samples to show you, but now we are still working on it with we have to speak about it. So we have done that, and we have planted 14,000 trees. We have done all these streets, we are doing this park, and now a big housing development with Christian de Porzampar. And every project is not really interesting, but the rigor and the coherence of all these projects makes sense. And I think we need 20 years to do a coherent landscape for at this scale. And what is very strange for us, when we did this plan, we were really frustrated because of the lack of control we could have on the shapes. And at the end, I think it has no real importance. The coherence of the language uh, seems to me more important now. So we planted 14,000 trees along what we used to call in France entrée de ville, and which are our real nightmare. So it was very, st we, we win, we won this competition, uh, and Bernard Lassu was the other serious competitor. And there is absolutely no drawing, except in this idea to put 14,000 trees, exactly the same tree everywhere. So it sounds a little stupid, but to do that in the south of France was a kind of miracle. We had to convince thousands of people not to do what, uh, you know, every idea you could have in the south of France. Just to keep that. It has been done, I know, that of course, you all know in uh, the south of Roma in Italy, it has been done uh, 70 years ago, I suppose. But except that, it's very hard to do that in a, in a place which will be a city. And it's the same Montpellier place. This is a small park. We did along a river. And you can see this language because on this line, <coughs> this line are following uh, a master plan. But <laughs> along this line, all the distances are different. And we, when you consider this park with a certain angle, it seems to be a random. So it's just a sample to show what means the application of this language everywhere at every scale. Something very important is to say that it's not a real park. All these kind of projects are done with very, very low budget. This could cost something like four pounds a square meter. And just to compare with a real park, seven Citroën in Paris cost uh, 350 pounds a square meter. So it's absolutely something different. It's called a park, but it's not really uh, the same kind of exercise. And honestly, I prefer that. Not the result, but this kind of <laughs> exercise. But even the result. And the same kind of... Um, this is a small project. A project we did with Norman Foster a very long time ago, <coughs> eight years ago. And this is from a Japanese garden. And 
you see you have built lines and kind of random of, plant, of plantation. And the issue we had with this project in Barcelona was the articulation between the grid of the city and a kind of um, curve in it. And we did not know how to do this curve. And of course, these drawings are very exaggerated. But this is the edge between a lawn and gravels. And it's done by a series of built lines filled, felt by uh, pebbles. The scale is totally wrong. But it, it was a kind of pedagogical way to show how to deal with every edges. So this is the edge between a forest and a, a shrub zone. So it, it was a way to deal with um, something controlled and something in random. And this is a project we did in the, self, in the center of France. And I must explain, this is a river, and this is a city, Issoudun, which was a medieval city and which looks <coughs> still a medieval city. The parcels are still living, but all this area around the river was abandoned and was kind of favela. Every um, piece of this parcel has been fenced and walled. Everything was closed and private and abandoned. And the city slowly bought all these pieces, and so we were commissioned to draw a park. And what we proposed is a kind of substitution process. We wanted to keep every part of this drawing, but to change every piece of it. So the drawing of the existing remains, but every piece is new. So that means, for example, that we uh, destroyed the walls, the fence, but we substitute these uh, fences by sort of edges. We kept the drawing of um, vegetable gardens, but now it's a kind of flower garden. So this picture has been, have been taken just one year after we, we did it. So now it's, I guess it's a little better. So this is a iris garden. This is a willow collection. But everything has been done according existing parcels. And just as a kind of anecdote, this iris garden during winter is a gravel gardens because we cut all the leaves and during the spring and summer it's a, it's a real iris garden. This is winter. And you can see we try to, to keep on the place uh, some existing uh, structure of these gardens. What was nice and not nice, so when we started, the mayor of the city was a, an important minister. And during the, when we, he was fired. And, <laughs> and he lost all this budget. And we, we must did it in, with nothing. So we, we took off all the alley a lot of furniture, all lighting system, everything. And we did, like you used to do in England, um, kind of meadow, flowering meadow, and some pieces are cutted lawn. 
And I think it was a chance not to have this budget. What was interesting is that very quickly, so a few months after we finished the work, because we used a very common and familiar language, people were able to understand what it was. It wasn't, everything was similar, but everything was open. And people uh, came in this garden, which was a, a, a private place before. So this is, for example, a kind of uh, orchard we planted where was existing a very old and destroyed orchard. So we, we, this is a secondary, but we collected all the uh, storm and raining water in ditches like that. And for example, this house and this door was behind the wall before, and now it is a kind of alley in this garden. <coughs> Sorry. So it was the first time we did uh, so precisely with uh, this kind of control, this, ki this substitution process of project. So it's not a drawing, it's a transposition of an existing language. And we did the same at another scale for the landscape of, of four new railway stations in the south of France. And I just show you this part of the substitution process in this project. This is Avignon. This is a city of Avignon. This is Le Rhône. This is La Durance. And all this drawing you can see is um, is not still existing. This was a kind of network of edges which were protecting from north wind, the Mistral. And what is wonderful with these edges is that they are following, of course, this direction, but in this other direction, they are following all the meanders of this river. And you can see it's a kind of memory of the movement of a river. So you can see the same on this, on this aerial picture. So you see all these edges organized, protecting from the wind, and all these curves correspond to the old meanders. So it's a kind of um, process we can understand and we can deal with today. So it's a... And this was another part of the language in Avignon and all the Vallée du Rhône. It's an alley of plane tree, and it, it was a hunting pattern. And it's not um, a grid. You know, when people are drawing a kind of city today, they just purpose a grid, orthogonal grid, planted with tree. These pieces in the landscape were kind of floating pieces. They are not connected with other places. It's just a kind of object in the landscape. And so for Avignon, we purposed, it's re really stupid, we purposed to, to organize all a network of edges, and we purposed to build this big Tez. Tez was the name of this hunting pattern I show you. And the building of the railway will be contained in that. And the second uh, <coughs> layer is composed by sort of orchard, which are the car park, uh, which you, you can imagine are huge in this kind of new railway stations. So it's all a reuse of a language. Of course, every piece of this language is new. The edge are not done as they were because we need a fast result. Uh, the, the scale of this stairs is very different. And of course, the orchard are not real orchard. So everything is different, but we guess that first, the language is readable, and secondly, and this is more complex to explain, that the mechanism to draw that is coherent with, with what was existing before. So it's not just a deduction of a language we apply on a site. There is a kind of uh, unrational process just to, under, to, to be able to, to play with these processes. 
And this is a scheme, but to do that requires a lot of work just to be able to reconduce, to transpose mechanisms. So this is a model study of uh, this project. This is one stage of the plan. So very quickly I show other project of this railway station. This is in Valence. And this is kind of 1.5 kilometers long. And this is a thèse, and this is a sort of orchard containing the car park. And containing, I must say, this incredible drawing of this road, which is something nobody can understand, but which is done by our public uh, structure, which draw all our roads. And it's a kind of uh, drawing therapy, we think, <laughs> for someone. So this is another project in Marseille, close to Marseille. And all this plateau <coughs> was a forest plateau. And we just proposed around this car park to deal with the same kind of material. And we have a small thesis around. What is not easy to, be sh to show is that before we started, a lot of people have been drawing sort of new city around these stations. And I, of course I don't show this, this project, but you had everywhere a grid, or, or, or worse, but a drawing of a kind of city, because of course every people thinks that around this kind of station will be developed activities and people start to uh, simulate what could be this kind of city. <coughs> and, and we resisted to that. So what we thought is that all this project must give qualities to this landscape. And if one day in 30 years there is some necessity to build something, there will be a strong constraint or a strong quality of a landscape to deal with drawing a city. So th this is a project of the car park. I don't really explain it, but you can understand we try to deal with this. Uh, so it's a grid, but we plant randomly trees on it. And this is another project of a station dealing with the same kind of theme. It's in Satola, close to Lyon. Calatrava did uh, a station. And everything is a kind of, um, you know, no, no word to say that. And we just proposed to plant, as a first thing, four kilometers of plane trees. Just because it is a way to connect all these accesses and because this uh, runway will be, uh, <coughs> new runway will be built on this side. Oh, sorry. So, so this is probably not the real other sample where better to explain what I want, but what is very strange with these cities, with this new station, is that they are built out of the city. Because today these stations are not done for uh, people living in cities, but for people living in a whole department. And what we think is that these projects are sort of garden in the landscape. But there are a lot of ambiguity because people are still thinking that this station will be connected with the city later. And it's probably not true. It doesn't work like that today. And it probably has no sense to consider that. It could be a, a lecture, this theme. Because it's very important. There is a kind of hypocrisy. When, at the beginning of the century, or end of the last century, when they built new sta stations, not the new, but the first station in France, in the same way they were built out of the city, uh, obviously, and after what Osman used to do projects to connect these new railway stations with downtown city. And what I know is that in Paris, the first um, Percé Haussmannienne 
has been done between the two stations, Gare de l'Est and Gare du Nord, for this reason. So it was the start of a new urbanism. And today, people still have this reference and wanted us to grow a kind of urban continuity. And I think it's totally wrong. I think the city is not done like that today. And we have to, um, to accept that phenomenon and really to give quality to that. It's why this project is not the best to recommend that. Avignon was better. So, and unfortunately, I don't have slides of it. Uh, I, I probably must go back to Avignon. I'm sorry about this boring uh, coming back. So, so we really refuse to do a grid, and we propose to develop this language, saying that at least uh, it is a correct landscape during the 10, 20 coming years. But what happened in Avignon is that we were involved. I, I must go back one more time. I'm, I'm really sorry. We did the work on all this peninsula. It's quite finished now. I, unfortunately, I don't have a slide of it. And this community um, commissioned us. So a lot of other people were working on it. Dominique Perrault, Christian de port um, I don't know who else, uh, less famous, to develop this area. And all these stupid reflex of doing a kind of new city with the grid uh, came. And because we invented a language for the railway station, we used the same language for the whole area. And I must say that now there is a real project for all the area dealing with this language. And I think it was rather successful because we, because first giving this quality to a landscape, we invented a language which, which now is used for this famous future city. And it's exactly what I want to do. So it's to give quality to landscape, to give quality to a coming city. So sorry, we go forward. <laughs> it will be terrible for you. So it's another scale, and it's an older project. It is, it's in Lyon. I'm not sure you have seen it during your last trip. Uh, so this is La Saône, this is Le Rhône. This is a kind, a sort of cathedral, and this is a cemetery. Everything is private on this hill because it's um, owned by religious institutions, excepted a kind of track, very small, very narrow track, which was used to carry um, dead people from the cathedral to the cemetery. Now they use car. <laughs> and so, you see, everything is private except in a very small uh, space. And it was abandoned, and the project on all this hill is to build a network of public promenade which, and the name of this project is a little pretentious, but it's Le Parc des Hauteurs. Michel Corazou is involved on this master plan too. And we did a first study of all, um, I don't know, Chemin de Ronde around it. And so the red part is what is public owned. And so we, with a very, very low budget, we had to refurbish this promenade. And I show that because I think it's very interesting. I prefer to work on this kind of programs than to do a closed garden. I think reactivating this kind of abandoned network, which are usually uh, just sold to private uh, people, is really a very interesting way to build a contemporary landscape in the city. So for example, the public part is just this bridge. Everything you can see around is private. <coughs> And we have this view. We didn't draw this passerelle. It has been done by Manuel Gautran. I don't really like it, but it is a, just to show you what means this uh, reactivation of uh, 
public small network in a city. So it's another bridge, another scale. And it's a really about process. This is, Norman Foster is supposed to build a bridge through this valley. This is 350 meters high, and this is three kilometers um, long. We probably will never build uh, this landscape, and I hope Norman Foster uh, will not build this uh, <laughs> bridge. But anyway, it was a good <laughs> exercise. <laughs> so we had to think about it, not about a pro not about what could be this landscape after, because this landscape <coughs> is okay, but we had to think about what will be the impact of the building of such a bridge. And you can think that to build such a bridge is a kind of war for landscape. It's a 10 year long war, and it's a total destruction of a landscape. So how to deal with this 10 year of building? So we started from an old aerial picture, and we found in yellow all abandoned um, edges, abandoned uh, border between parcels. Some of these edges were used for uh, country track, this is a word, or you can understand it, or for ditch to collect rainwater. water. And what we propose is a process. So usually when a public institution by this kind of um, highway or bridge, the institution by a certain width, kind of 100 meters, a rectangle. And after they have to refurbish the landscape. And it never works, of course. So what we propose is to buy bigger than necessary, but dealing exactly precisely with existing edges, which are kind of natural existing gap in the landscape. And we propose to buy bigger area to allow to, allow to take off earth and to put earth on non-used area. What we propose, secondly, is to reinforce and to re-employ all these old abandoned tracks which would have been used as um, chemin de chantier, what is the word? Work accesses. And these drawings show you, for example, certain stage of the process. When one pile would have been finished, earth could have been put on it and new plantation. And this is the last stage. So, so this is just the enlargement on two stages. So the red spots correspond to piles of the, build of the bridge. So this is an intermediary stage with black is um, working places, green is uh, finished and uh, replanted parcels. And this is a finished result. So what is this result? It's obviously not the reconstitution of a country um, of a country landscape. It's not agriculture at all, of course. It, it would have no sense. Around that, it's a kind of abandoned agriculture. It starts to be a kind of small forest. In Frisch, I don't know the word for Frisch. Wasteland. wasteland. Not really wasteland, but it, it's, a, it's a kind of forest. And this is a sort of garden during a short period, because slowly the same phenomenon will appear. That means that slowly it will not be new plantation as we purpose, but it will be this kind of new natural growing forest. So we just are dealing with a period. This project is a 20 years project. After what we guess, it will vanish, and we want it to vanish. So it's really a dealing with building processes and with time. And what I like in this stage, it, it's like a garden. It's a garden dealing with the remaining of an agriculture, agricultural structure. So 
I show that, especially for students, but it's very boring to uh, understand the slides because it's, it was a succession of tables. They are supposed to be uh, only one table and it will happen. You, you will have to work. So it has been done on, um, this is um, La Manche, so, so uh, Ocean Channel. Sorry, it's very close to, to your place. Um, this is La Baie de Somme. And it's a wonderful landscape because everything is artificial in reality. Not really artificial. This is a huge natural mechanism because this bay is empty at every low tide. And this is an agriculture which exists only because of the existence of this small uh, ditch. This pond are used to collect water during the high tide and all these small canals um, are kind of flush. I mean, water is, when tide is low, all this water is collected by these canals and flush all the alluvium which deposits during the high tide. And there is a small village. This village is an uh, old uh, fisherman village built on a dam. So it's a very subtle equilibrium between very fragile building and a huge natural mechanism. And so we were commissioned, it was a competition, because, uh, because people wanted a kind of project on this place to control the development of housing, to control the place of new roads, to control uh, a lot of small things like that. But they were expecting and we were supposed to produce a master plan. And we didn't produce a master plan, of course. And we won this competition and were fired just a little after, but <laughs> as usually. <laughs> But w so we, pr we purpose the process. No, no, we worked a lot on it, but after, you know, politics in France is strange and people changed uh, two times, so we, we lost this client. So it's a table done with three successive tables. So this is the first one. And what we did is to identify, I hope the English word is correct, problematic. So this landscape is okay, it, it uh, needs nothing, except it, there are some problems. And for example, I just showed you a uh, problem. One is the development of housing, one is the development of arbor. So this is, this first table vertically shows the existing situation and we try to understand what the language was on the place. This is the existing housing built with a contained way, so only on a, on a ditch, not a ditch, sorry, um, a dam. So because of the risk of the tide, houses were only built on a dam. But today, the situation is this one. You have this kind of sprawl, as American people say, so you can build everywhere, except it on the littoral, because this is absolutely protected, of course. And about water, what was existing is this, what I show you in the aerial picture. So this small pond and canal, <coughs> this was the language of the water system on this place. So these are proposals we did for the problematic I still explain you these two last problematics. What we proposed for the housing is not a zona. So we propose to build new dam and to allow the building only on this dam. About water, we propose because technicians first have done a triangle, a round, a square, everything you can imagine. We just propose to deal with the same language. And we propose after to combine the new dam and the the way to extend the harbor. And this third table was a way 
uh, to show references. So I don't really comment, but this was from no Norway. I just can show another problematic, which <coughs> is um, this is a ref this is a project and reference. It's car park because this is a car park used only during summer to access to uh, the beach. And we purpose to do this kind of arch agriculture. So it's small poplar wood and big meadow. And cars during two months are using the meadow as car park. And during the winter, d during all the other parts of the year, it's uh, an agricultural landscape. <coughs> so I show you some um, piece of the drawing you have seen. So this is a famous village. I don't really comment, but you, you can understand it. We did a lot of work understanding as w I was done the parcel. So there was one direction, but on the other direction, all the canals were there. So it's one more time a superimposition between built process and natural phenomenon. So this is a famous extension of the arbor <coughs> of the village. Uh, to be honest, we worked, we have been working two more years on this project. And we had to deal with a kind of outlaw proposal because we proposed to build along the water, which is absolutely forbidden, in the place of building this area. And we had to convince people to change the law according to this landscape theme. And so part of it has been done and part of it not because of lack of uh, political project, of course. But if I show you this project, especially for students, it's because we, it's not a master plan. It is a succession of processes dealing with time, dealing with problematic. A master plan is only a political tool. It helps politicians to be elected because they can show the future with a strong assurance. And we are not dealing with that. We are just dealing with reality. And we know that reality will move on a certain on certain team, and we can um, not control the phenomenon, but deal with phenomenon. So this was existing village. I like this kind of picture, very easy to be done, it's just a, a Xerox and some red spot. But you see, this is built, and everything else is nature. nature. And other competitor has just done master plan of it. And what sense could it have? So we have to change um, carousel. But it's still true, I think. I've seen a lot of recent big urban design still dealing with uh, a master plan, which is only uh, a political tool. Uh, we, we must understand that, I guess. So you probably know better than I do this place. So it's Greenwich Peninsula at the beginning of it, and I only show some, uh, some aspect of the project. So we did that with Philippe Gumuchan, which is just, he was just here. And I guess he will be, he will agree with <laughs> But you, you agree, I guess, now, because we, you translate this article. Um, so it was a very strange exercise. And because you first have seen a lot of projects dealing with memory. And in this place, because the soil was so polluted, there is no memory, because they were supposed to, to clean two meters uh, of everything. So. It's a kind of moon, it's nowhere. So this is a strange condition for an exercise. Secondly, we had a strange exercise because we were supposed to produce a correct landscape for the millennium, and this landscape was supposed, is still supposed to be a landscape for the future. And we were supposed to do it very, very quickly. So what we proposed, is to deal with the geographical scale. And so this is Greenwich Peninsula. 
And these are existing parks like uh, Greenwich Observatory um, Park or Garden, I don't know the name. And this is a reference of an Australian peninsula which has nothing to see with this project, except that naturally such a meander would have been colonized by marshland and alluvial forest. And what we thought is that because we were not sure with the future of this place, and we are still not sure, we wanted, of course, to deal with a master plan done mostly by Philippe here, but also to, to produce a kind of um, landscape at this geographical scale, which gives quality to the place, but which is not really the negative of a urban design. So we want this place to be a landscape with which people will have to deal in the future, building real pieces. It's more complex. It could be a lecture alone, of course, and just show this attitude we have. Because, of course, it's more complex because there were streets, there are streets, there are parcels, there are private parcels. Now there are car parks. So in reality, we just did the start of this process. So because of the lack of time we had, we, we were looking for a material growing very, very fast, having a, an immediate presence. And this is a park we know in Belgium, done by poplars, with a very high density of plantation. It's not a park, it's a, see, I don't know what it is, it's, we'll see after. And this is a picture we started with. It's from Oxford Child. So it's a poplar grove uh, planting. And this is a kind of river digging a sort of clearing in this plantation. And we noticed on this picture that these trees, which are probably willows, are different from this uh, plantation of poplars. And what we proposed is a process. So this is done from this reference. The first stage, which is a built stage now, is a very, very dense plantation of mostly own beans and willows, every 1.7 meters, which allowed us to build the space for the Millennium Exhibition. And you probably have seen even if it's winter, sort of reading clearing. So uh, what I try to say is you can read the clearing. And this is a space for the exhibition. Superimposed to this grid, on the same geometry, there are semi-mature trees. Following different stages, we will de-densify this first grid. Trees will grow. There will be um, alea. There will be incidents, there will be surprise. And slowly, we will reach this kind of park done by very big trees in random for natural or artificial reason. This sculpture of this first stage will be done for natural reason, but as I said, also for building reason. People will have to dig in this mass. And I, so these were the principles. We built it, and I think on uh, a third of the territory, this has been done and work, works. And I hope we could extend part of it on the private places. We did with Philip um, kind of general plan showing that on private parcel, the same logic, of course, must be, must be prescri prescribed. And all the coherence is between the common grid and the common palette. There is a common palette for all these trees. So these are references picture I like, because you see line of plantation and these shapes, which appear 
according natural phenomenon like growth or storm or wind. This is a, a field of uh, crops after a storm. And this is from North America where you can see all these stages. So it's all a landscape done by a very clear uh, series of rules. So we have to command this project because um, not this is not a project, but um, because what we try to avoid too is um, a lot of stereotype about park, because we were supposed to do a real park with uh, pergola and pond and uh, uh, promenade and a lot of uh, <coughs> things, and. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to deal with these very simple materials. And I must say that last year, spending a lot of time in, in America, not learning English, but looking at, uh, for example, Olmsted work, I discovered that at the beginning of, we, we in France, especially, probably you, you have a more precise knowledge that I had first, we think that Olmsted work looked like um, Peter's garden. And in reality, it's very different. It sometimes looks similar because of the lack of maintenance. The lack of maintenance has banalized Olmsted Garden. But first, it is ideal. Oh, I don't know the, the good. He, he worked with very natural elements like wood, marshland, um, meadow, and that was all. And it, it was, I think, very, very modern. It's very different from Peter-esque attitude and, of course, from French uh, tradition. And I think it's still very, uh, it has sense today to work with this kind of um, culture. And what I discovered in America, because I, I thought they were all stupid and just uh, looking at the TV, is that it's in relationship with a very strong philosophical um, background. It was done by, with Emerson and Thoreau, which are transcendentalists, in, and they were very close. So I discovered that this material is very singular and very contemporary, and I discovered that it's uh, um, in relationship with uh, a philosophical, vi philosophical view, with a vision of the society and the world. So it moved my way to think about the project, of course. So this is still about process in a very different way. It's a project we are building now in Antwerpen in Belgium. It is, sorry, an extension of um, Middelheim Park. It's a big historical park in Anvers, Antwerpen. This is a historical park. And it's a sculpture, it's a, very, it's a huge collection of sculpture. And they wanted us to extend, uh, so, so this is bigger now, seven hectares of this park. And it was a very, very strange exercise because the existing park, I don't have a picture of it, is done by very old trees and around there was nothing. And they wanted uh, an immediate result and the cost is four pounds a square meter. So it's very important to speak about uh, this aspect. So as you understand, it's quite 1% of Park 7 Citroën. So it's really another exercise. And a second issue, very stimulating, w was that we had to spend the budget in two weeks because afterwards they w would have lost this budget. It was the <laughs> other way. So before, and, and we had to deal with a huge collection of structures, we had no time to do it. So. We were perplexed. We first thought that it was absolutely necessary to do something uh, very different from this is existing park. And we thought we had to deal with a new layer, which is obviously uh, different from the existing structure, because we, we know we cannot do the same. And we had this kind of reference. This is in a forest in the south of France with a kind of orchard. 
with this kind of cost, we knew we couldn't work with fill and empty space. You know, to build uh, something which closes space, you, you must build a wall or edge, and it costs a lot. With this kind of budget, we only could deal with density, so not with real space. Uh, I mean, close, uh, empty or void, I don't know how to say that. So these are serial of orchards. And this is a very interesting orchard because it has different densities. And we thought this, all these constraints could be a way to, to, to invent um, a kind of texture. And it was a similar way. Uh, it's very close to Greenwich Project because it's working with process and texture and not with a space composition in a classical way. And we tried very quickly to think about frames. So this is 6 meters, 12, 3, and variations. So th this is our scheme, but I must show that. And because we had to spend this budget, we had to know how many trees we wanted to plant. And we develop a kind of stat statistic approach dealing with different grid, different density, and different proportion of it, trying to reach the known budget we had. And we did a kind of project. So now it's different. I d I'm sorry, I've, I'm two years late about my slides. So it's quite finished, but this drawing is not exactly. So we didn't really draw, but we, with a statistic me method, we tried to spend this budget uh, proposing different density of different situations. After what, at the second stage of study, we used to work with uh, the curator of this museum and dealing with a collection of sculpture. But you see, it's still a texture and not a classical composition. I hope it's still architecture, landscape architecture, but different way. I show very quickly because it's um, one more time bad slides I carry with me. It's part of the exercise we did at Harvard. And this is Boston area. And in white, we try to identify abandoned area. So, not in white, the gray part of this white uh, rectangle correspond to the abandoned part of this area. And abandoned, so, so we, try, we, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, do the map of the abandoned surfaces in the Boston area. And probably it's more than 25% of the territory. And of course, it's not really, everybody knows that, but it's not mapped. It's really an unmapped land because it's private and public. Um, it's everywhere, it has different scale, but it's a huge part of the territory. And so we first try to understand what, where was this unmapped country. And after what we tried, and I'll show you just very uh, simple sample, to understand what we can do with these abandoned surfaces. And my purpose, <coughs> my purpose in the studio was to think we don't want to refurbish them because we don't have money, we have nothing to do that, no project, no ownership. What we wanted is, because we know that abandoned area will be like that during more than one generation. They sometimes are 20, 30 years like that. And what we want to do is to parasite these places to build a landscape. And we consider this landscape like a as a provisory stage, like an intermediary landscape. And it's similar than what I showed you before. People will have, would have to deal with this landscape in the future to extend the city or to do I don't know what. Usually what happens in such a situation, people are waiting for investment to build the big project in some part with a wonderful master plan. We don't want to deal with that. We just want to colonize. Colonize is not a good word, but 
to build a landscape with this abandoned place. So it's very difficult for me to comment that because I, I never understood really. It's all a series of very simple process to colonize this area using sort of agricultural tools. So it's a, it's a kind of very, very, very low cost agriculture. And it could have been used, it could be used because people are interested in this proposal to clean pol polluted soils. It could be used to to make grow some plants. So it's one more time a succession of stages. We, we don't plant a park. We first clean the soil. Secondly, we colonize with a meadow. After what, it's all a succession of ecological stages. It's not ecology, it's transposition of ecology. It's why I show you uh, this project of Rue de Maux with the birches. It's not ecological, it's of course clearly artificial, but trying to deal with transposition of ecological knowledge we have. So it's all a theory of uh, this sort of new agriculture in city. This model shown a theory of stages of the same recolonization of the land. Very quickly, one of the students tried to work on a main highway between two big um, reservation, landscape reservation. This is uh, uh, ocean. And he did a kind of um, collection of all abandoned places along this highway, and there are huge abandoned pieces. This is just one sample. So he just did this work to understood what was abandoned. And I just want to show, um, yeah, after what the method was to, to do a kind of classification of the pieces we have to deal with. And for every piece to understand what kind of language could be developed for this transformation. And I just wanted to show you this map, I call it a kind of chromosome map. So these are all the pieces available to build a landscape along 30 kilometers of an highway. And so I don't show you all the study, but for every typology of piece was um, invented a special, specific language. And one more time, we wanted to work with the coherence of all this language for every pieces. What is strange is that we accept to, to work with residual shapes. So we absolutely don't want to, to superimpose a new structure. We don't want to superimpose a new geometry for it, because we cannot. Nobody, this would have been le grand projet, and there is no grand projet, of course. So we accept, and we think it's, it could be even very beautiful to work with these pieces because they are readable. It's like a, a real agricultural landscape. It, it has not been built to be nice. It has been built with a series of rules and all these rules has been applied with a big rigor. And we think that the rigor with this language, with these pieces, could build an interesting landscape. But it's absolutely what, not what we learned at school. 20 years ago. This is just a sample of a work on an arbor. This arbor is abandoned, but not really. This arbor is in mutation. And what purpose the students is to accompany the mutations. He called this process um, accompanying substitution process. So it's not, as I show you for my own project, a substitution and after it's done. It's all a series of successive substitutions. And this kind of model are very formal. I don't really like that, but it show you, so we did a series of models showing how with a precise language of landscape, we could accompany all the mutation for example, transforming edges, transforming surfaces, transforming 
uh, street, etc. So that's all. It's finished. <laughs> Questions for Michelle? Sebastian? Okay, can you? What project? When, when, when did you do the first project you showed? I think it was the uh, <laughs> Jardin Elementaire. It was. Um, the, the question was uh, when did you do the first project you showed? It was 12 years ago. <laughs> you can explain it was when you were in Rome, yeah? No, I was in Rome and I, I had two years to. And to do what I want. The, you're not a, the one on this at the seaside where with the ponds that are moving. Um, did, was it something you did for study purposes or was it something, was it a job? Well, I only do things for money. I mean, it was a real job. <laughs> ah, okay. No, 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 it was a very serious job. You mean uh, the pounds uh, with Renzo Piano? No, no, it was a real uh, commission accepted that just after the war started in Yugoslavia and we were obliged to abandon it. But it has been started, works has been started. So part of the pound have, have been uh, excavated and of course they had to abandon the place. And more than in the so mayor. What are they actually, what are they actually uh, doing there? Just the ponds? I know the owner is in uh, prison, <laughs> prison, and probably for a very long time. You know, it's Italy manipulated. No, you, you know that in Italy, uh, politicians uh, uh, have had some issue uh, ten years ago, and and I think this guy is uh, definitely uh, out of uh, use. No, you you understand what? what I mean? We, Italy is a French country. So it's politically, we can do nothing now. It's, so it's abandoned, just abandoned. Can I ask you a question? Um, generally speaking, the projects you do are very much connected with the former agricultural structure of the land. But looking in detail, the actual planting is very, um, very reminiscent in a way of classical echoes in the sense that you work on a very, very strict grid for the planting. Can you say something about that? Yes. <laughs> no, no, it's a very difficult question, of course. So, uh, because I think there is a limit about the way we are dealing with existing structures. Because at the end, it could be, I have two things to say about that. So first, it could be at a kind of new academism, or a kind of recipe. So you just have to reproduce what is existing. In reality, it's not really true, because as I tried to explain about Avignon, it's not, you have to reinvent everything. The scale is different, the reasons are dif different. And if you do it, literally, it doesn't work. You see it, it looks fake. So first, because I had this preoccupation a few years ago, probably we, we spoke of that with Sebastian, I thought it was the end of a system. This substitution process could have been a kind of small dead. And probably I was a little tired with memory. So um, what I wanted to say to answer to your question is, uh, I like to deal with memory, with agricultural knowledge, but it's a transposition, of course. It's not a literal application of an, an existing language. So this transposition is something strange. It's not rational at all. It makes part of what is a project, which is mostly intuitive, and which is, and which is uh, fed, fed, fed. 
By all the culture, and part of this culture could be uh, from uh, art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one more time, it's uh, complex because uh, the first drawing I've shown about this project in Roma are very close to land art inspiration. And now I, I think it was very poor because it was literal. We literally um, used this art reference. It's more subtle. We don't really understand what it is. You're right. It's probably sorry. Um, it works. No. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I mean, um, these transpositions are something we don't really control. If we control them, they are dead, I guess. So this is the artistic part of our work. But. But we have to deal with the readability of our work, so they must be very, very stupid and simple. If not, it, uh, I suppose it's not readable. But I really insist on that, because if not, I'm, I have tried to do this kind of exercise of substitution with a lot of students in different studios, and it's a real work. And it's not enough to have a computer and to reproduce what... It's not coupé-coller. What is English word for that? Replaced. Get replaced. It's all a work of transformation. So now, coming back from America, I'm still uh, interested in memory. And in another hand, I think we have to add vision about the landscape and city. Um, Sometimes we just need to transform radically things. And I think we have to find some equilibrium between dealing with memory and having vision. I think now we have a real lack of vision on the landscape. And what has been done in part on Greenwich with Philip is that we, this geographical scale was real vision, I guess. Not, uh, it sounds a little uh, mystic. I mean, a vision, uh, yeah. I think a piece of nature was better than the reminding of an industrial use. We had a real deep debate about that with Dominique Perrault. Dominique Perrault is doing in Bordeaux, in the southwest of France, a very similar project. Name is La Bastille. You can see it in his wonderful big books. And it's exactly similar. The size is similar. And he just built a kind of city dealing with um, all the remaining of the industrial activity. That means railway tracks, um, building plots, etc. And the drawing is wonderful, I must say. What he did is absolutely wonderful, except that when you know Bordeaux, you know that it will take probably one or two centuries to build this city he has, he has drawn. And what sense would we have this drawing in two centuries? So, and probably nothing will be built. And this drawing is wonderful and I guess very academic. And I, and I, I could have done it uh, but not so nice. And, and this was a real preoccupation I had. And I think it's better in such a place to, to plant a lawn or a forest. And after people in 30 years, if they start to need some new part of a city, they will have probably new reason to do that. Because I think there is a real lack of vision today about uh, how to live in a landscape, in a city. I'm looking for an apartment in Paris, and what I see is just boring. There is no relationship between housing, living, and outside, and landscape. The best sample I know is South Kensington, I must say. I think it was, I, it's very interesting and very modern, the way there was a real relationship between uh, live, the house and external space, private, public, semi-public. But except that there is no real vision about that, or very marginal. So my response is not clear, but uh, it's another response. <laughs> but actually, can I just add to that? Because what's quite interesting is when you compare what Dominique Perrault did at the Bibliothèque, where he tried to transpose a park, where he literally tried to transpose a park, and a forest into the middle of the library. And actually, if you take Hood Moor, if you take Hood Moor, it works actually much better, because there's a respect, and I think, in, in, do, in um, Michel's work about the robustness of nature. So where in Hood Moor there is, an, it's not a forest as he says, 
it actually feels more like a forest than the very artificial transplantation, if you like, of a forest into the middle of the bibliothèque, which isn't the processes. It's sort of almost dead, while in the Rue de Maux, which is a new one, it actually feels very much alive. And I think that the work is, is very interesting, the way that he respects, as I say, that robustness of nature and the processes that go through and allow the accidental nature of it. And also is very unfussy about the planting, in a sense. It's actually very agricultural, the planting, and very kind of easygoing, not very um, delicate in the sense of an or ornate garden. No, no, I think he's very kind. No, Philippe, we, we don't have to do the process of Dominique Perrault. It's one of our best architects. I appreciate a lot of his work. So, of course, I don't want to do any process of Dominique Perrault's work. Uh, I think it, this kind of attitude was air du temps. You know, I didn't invent anything. He didn't invent anything. It was l'air du temps, something we were several to, 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 to turn around that. But we must precise that for students. Dominique Perrault's work was probably more than 1,000 pounds by square meters. Rue de Maux was 300. 300, 1,000. Uh, yeah. No, 30. 30 to 1,000. And in Dominique Perrault's case, it's a kind of decor, wonderful, with huge trees carried by helicopter. And dead, just to joke with him, I, I, to, I say to him, because it's a kind of friend, I, I, I say to him, it's a c'est un jardin de vieux, because these, these trees are old, mine are young. <laughs> it's the only looks I have. <laughs> but the, there is, just to follow that up as well, in the Rue de Maux, your trees are very much interrelated with the structure of Renzo's yes, yeah, of buildings. So it's like there's a very close relationship between you and the architect. Mm. And although Dominique Perrault's is his own <laughs> building, it seems like that is not actually related to the building yeah. at all. But it, it's very dramatic. Uh, D Dominique Perrault's project, it, it's not so bad, of course. We, we must be careful with that. It's, it's very spectacular, or very dramatic. The storm. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Are there any more questions about George? I was just wanted to make a statement about those trees in the Rue Maux. They are beautiful also because they have an obvious reason, good reason to be there. I mean, for privacy of people being having those great windows in front of them. So we like those trees because they are beautiful and also because we find them a very good reason uh, to be there also, which is not exactly the case, maybe, uh, in the library. We did a project before, and it was a courtyard with a, uh, two line of trees, and it just didn't work. And so we did that very quickly. I must say something about that, because sometimes I think the influence of this kind of project is terrible, because it's a kind of collage. You have to take a piece of nature and you can put it because you have Xerox, scanner, computer, you can put it everywhere. And I don't like that, even for my own work. I think there was something a little dangerous with this kind of attitude, which is just to, because a landscape requires conditions. A landscape is uh, correct because it's true, it sounds true, it's leg legitim legitimate. Legitim Legitim, legitimate. Uh, this, uh, this collage attitude is something I hate. And I did that, I must say. I, and sometimes I'm not very uh, comfortable. I don't feel really comfortable with this attitude because it, it's so easy. So I think it was a good response in a strange location. But I think we must be being teachers or students or anything very careful with that attitude because a real landscape has hundreds of reasons to exist. Mm -hmm. And it's not just uh, a reference carried anywhere. So this is very important. And this is true for both projects. I mean, Dominique Perrault and mine. And this is a, a big default. But I don't know what, but what, why not? Sometimes it's not so bad. But for example, I did this kind of lecture, I must say the same, in, uh, in Sweden. And I show that. And Nobody reacted, <laughs> because everywhere around us there was birches, <laughs> in courtyard, outside, along the highway, everywhere, and it was wonderful and well done and artificial to some time. 
So they look at that and so what? <laughs> <laughs> that was very good, a good lesson because of course it's, it, and in their case, it has more, more sense. In our case, it's just kind of small exotism. So I don't, I'm not masochist, of course. I like this project, but you see the limit of this attitude. <coughs> Thank you very much, Michel. Thank you.